Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks again for joining us, Fading Memories listeners. You know how much I appreciate that you give us your attention every week. With me is Charlotte Bela. I'm pretty sure I got that right. So thanks for joining us, Charlotte. My audience knows I butcher names really well. It's a, it's a superpower of mine. <laughs> no, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. So we're going to be discussing why caregivers don't prioritize their own needs and self-care. But before mm -hmm. we jump into the topic, can you tell us about yourself and what you do? I know you're also a podcaster, so give I that am. a shout out. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I am a caregiver for my husband. He has had cancer for almost a decade now. Oof. And so we have been navigating through life with that. And, you know, it's been up and down. Um, and luckily, I'm still able to do it. Right. So we uh, just like to try to find ways to enjoy our life. Sometimes it kind of like punches us in the stomach, but you know, we work hard to kind of just be out there and live, um, which isn't always easy, which I realized when I first became a caregiver, because I thought I had my own self-care routine down and everything was balanced. And then all of a sudden I find out that my husband has cancer and everything just goes by the wayside which was surprising because at the time and currently I work as a yoga and meditation teacher. So you would think that someone who has those skills would just be able to effortlessly jump into just refashioning and looking at self-care um, as they go along. And that was not the case. So when I actually finally got my feet underneath me and was able to you know, find a balance, which is never balanced. Right. But finding that in between that would work. Um, I realized that if I had trouble, um, caring for myself with all the skills and knowledge that I had, that it has to be extremely difficult for people who didn't. And so I decided to start the love your care giving life podcast. Um, because I wanted other caregivers to know that the things that they were going through, we're not just them because I think not feeling seen makes caregiving very lonely. And it really makes it difficult for you to even begin to set boundaries to care for yourself. So I started that and then, you know, have just been spreading the word as much as I can that, you know, caregivers really matter. Their needs are just as important. And, and unfortunately that's a very uncomfortable and difficult thing to kind of wrap our minds around sometimes. Definitely. I got the worst of it from the medical profession. It was just like, they just assumed that I had nothing else to do, but drop everything and, and bring my mom to the doctor because the doctor wanted to see her for, you know, blah, blah, blah. There was a day I said we were, she was having what appeared to be UTI issues, but they weren't a urinary tract infection. And so they were trying to figure out what was going on. And this one particular was a wet Friday. I go out with a cycling group and I, I peeled off a little bit early because I'm like, I have no recordings. I have no photography clients. I have nobody that's going to bug me. I'm going to go home, shower, dress, eat, and really just, just tackle a bunch of work and just, you know, yeah, should not have put that out in the universe because I'm literally getting dressed out of the shower. I've not dried my hair. I've not eaten lunch. It's about 1125 and the doctor's office calls and I, well, the doctor would like you to bring your mother in. And I'm like, excuse me. That's not like just that easy. I have to drive, you know, 15 minutes to go get her. I have to then bring, you know, then get her to go into the car, which that wasn't too big a deal. And then drive like another 20 miles to the doctor. So like you're talking at minimum an hour just to get her to the doctor. And I said, why exactly does he want to see her? And so essentially <laughs> the primary care physician wanted to see her so we could set up an ultrasound appointment. And I'm like, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have time for that today. And 
I did not need to, I did not need a zoom call or FaceTime call to, to know exactly what that nurse's expression was like, because she was like, you, you, you don't, you, you, you can't bring her. I mean, it was just like utter shock. And I'm like, no, I said, I have a business. I work for myself. I'm like, if you wanted me to bring my mom in, you needed to like, let me know yesterday. Like then I could have made arrangements with the care home and, you know, like rearrange my schedule. I'm like, I can't just rearrange my life in the middle of the day. And so then there was all these back and forth phone calls, but the, the medical system that she was with, I couldn't call the doctor's office directly. So God forbid I missed their phone call because then I had to basically call like the main number and then they'd route it, you know, and then I'd, then I'd have to literally stand there with my phone to make sure I didn't miss the doctor's phone. Oh my God. It was so, by the time, it was not a good afternoon, to say the least. But it was like, hello, like, why am I like, I'm trying to advocate for my mom here. Why do I have to now fight you over what appears to be, in my view, you being stupid and illogical? And I'm just trying to make this as easy as possible. Like, tell me what you need. Let's make it get it scheduled. Let me talk to the care home and and like make a plan you know somebody with advanced alzheimer's you don't just drop in and go okay we're gonna get in the car now. right <laughs> good well Lord. and i think medical professionals largely drop the ball when it comes to caregivers because oftentimes they're the first ones that let us know that's what we're that's what we've jumped into without even asking us if that's something we planned on doing or giving, you know, you sit down and they tell you about a diagnosis or, you know, this is how far your parents' disease has advanced. And now all these changes have to be made and you're filled with all this information, but none of that has anything to do with what you have to contend with, what you have to look forward to. And I think that sends a really strong message to us that it doesn't matter. Like we, we become caregivers because for many reasons, but largely because we love the people that we're caring for <laughs> and liking them is a different story sometimes. That is true. <laughs> but, you know, what we do is so important for the people that we care for because we are the ones that get them to all those appointments and make sure that they follow the protocols at home and watch out for them. But we're not seeing as any part of a team. And I'm not saying that, you know, we're medical professionals and should be side by side with doctors, but I do think that something has to be said for everything that we do as caregivers it is extremely important because we're 24 hours, 365. We're not those, you know, rushed appointments at the doctor's office. Um, we're the ones who have to care for them when they come home from having surgery or something has happened. Um, and so that importance should be made clear to us when we become caregivers, when you're, when you're in the office and they say, all right, your husband has this disease. We're going to go over all that information. And then we're going to spend at least 15 minutes on you. These are the things that you should know are going to happen that you have to decide on. And also, do you want to do this? Like yeah. no one really <laughs> asks, do you want to do this? And so caregivers largely don't understand that they actually have a choice. And if you feel you have a choice, then you put more value on what you say yes to. And that I, makes think sense. That's, I think that's where a lot of us valuing what we do comes from, because from the very start, it's not about us which is fine. We're not the ones that sit, that are sick. However, we're the ones supporting them. And it's a full-time job. Even if you don't do it full-time, even if you continue to work and you have, you know, parents, family members having care while you're at work, because you, you, someone has to pay for it. Right. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, it's still a full-time job. No matter how much time you're in the trenches, you are always concerned, always thinking about it and always doing something actively for the person that you're caring for. So I think that's that's one of the biggest problems is caregivers are from the very start not told or shown how important they are when they become caregivers. Just that acknowledgement would be huge. Mm -hmm. And the, I think one of the biggest differences between your caregiving experience and say mine and other people 
caring for a family member with a form of dementia is you at least had a diagnosis and here's the things we need to do. Mm -hmm. My mom got diagnosed mid stage of Alzheimer's and my parents never discussed it with my sister or I. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was by the time she was diagnosed, it was like a duh, like anybody could see this, (laughs) but it was, there was no, okay, well, these are the things we're going to need to do with your mom or, you know, like, like, this is the stuff I'm going to need help with, you know, speaking Mm -hmm. as if I were my dad. And I know that there are a lot of people who are diagnosed with some form of dementia causing illness. The Mm -hmm. doctors don't even tell them because, well, there's nothing we can do. So what's the point of them knowing? And I know as, as my mom's primary care person, Mm -hmm. you know, was not her primary care doctor, but I was her primary medical care advocate Mm-hmm. You know, it was like her neurologist did acknowledge, you know, you're doing a really good job. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, it was just assumed that, I mean, yeah. I'm assuming that my dad had the same issue and we've been dealing with it. We, you know, over the summer dealt with my husband had an open wound on the bottom of his foot and being pre-diabetic, mm-hmm. it was, it was a serious problem. Yeah. And I mean, it was almost the, the wound was almost to the bone. Thankfully, you know, he's a smart guy. He kept it clean, never got infected. But Mm -hmm. literally the podiatrist told him, you need to go home, sit on your butt for two two to three months. Did not ask him if that was physically possible. My husband's kind of ADHD, so no. Um, He's a (laughs) self-employed real estate (laughs) broker and property manager. So uh, again, no. But at one point I said, you need to tell this jerky podiatrist because it was like you're not staying off your foot you know it's gonna get i'm not gonna go there it's gonna get infected and you're it's gonna become a bone infection and you're gonna lose your foot and die i mean it was just like the worst gloom and doom i'm like dude the guy stepped on a carpet tack back in december this is and he was diagnosed with this problem in may so i'm like it's been five months he's kept this clean i think i think we're doing okay and i had told him i said you need to go tell this idiot podiatrist who does not understand that there is no quote leave of absence that's Mm -hmm. paid for Mm -hmm. somebody who's self-employed you need an occupational therapist to help you navigate around the house not on the crutches not on the scooter but Mm -hmm. like somebody to work with you to like stay off your foot but get Mm -hmm. your stuff done and in our in our conversation i'm like oh and also please explain to this um whom I'm assuming is an intelligent person. Could you please explain to this doctor that just assuming that there was somebody at home that could take over all of your responsibilities, all of the chores you do, the dog walking that you do, and, you know, everything. He just assumed it was somebody here to wave a magic wand. What if he was taking care of me? Like, oh, it made me so insane. It was like, (laughs) fortunately, they had a really good, you know, that... So that was prior to a a visit and that visit went really well. I think his foot was healing despite himself. So, (laughs) you know, it's like, but I've actually told people and I've written an article that I don't know if it's been published when this comes out, it's not published as a recording. Mm -hmm. It's an article I wrote that says, I will not be my husband's caregiver and society shouldn't expect me to. Now it's different if he was diagnosed like your husband with a cancer or something. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he lost his foot because he wouldn't get off of it. <laughs> I'm talking more about a dementia causing disease, but it's like my husband is a foot taller than me, maybe 13 inches, give or take, mm-hmm. um, about 100 pounds more than me. He does not accept help willingly, which is one of the other <laughs> reasons he's not staying off his foot. And, you know, so it's like, so I can't physically deal with some of his stuff. He yeah. emotionally won't let me deal with his stuff. So, Hello, expecting me to be the caregiver for somebody yeah. who's unwilling and physically I'm unable, like, hello, this sounds like a serious recipe for <laughs> multiple disasters. So, well, you know, and it and shouldn't th- be assumed like a, a person should should in a perfect world be able to say, I don't want to be a caregiver and be OK with it. Right. Exactly. And so I think that just the fear of judgment starts before you even get there. I mean, caregiving um, is run off of fear of judgment sometimes. And I think 
that people should know that they don't have to be caregivers. I don't know if anyone's ever told them that before. You don't have to. I mean, you can just be a wife, <laughs> a, a spouse, you know, a spouse, a, a child. If you are not able to do it, if you feel that you can't set the boundaries for you to be able to live life and also be a caregiver, it, uh, yes, it has to do with how much money you have to spend on someone else doing it for you. But um, it's always a choice. And I think that's the problem. Like it's a passive choice. Most of us do because it's just assumed. It was assumed mm -hmm. I would take care of my husband. I assumed, but nobody asked me, you know, do you actually want to do this? And here's why I'm asking, because these are some things that you might actually have to deal with. Um, just know that going into this next phase of your life. And I, and yeah, most of us would say yes anyway. Right. But us saying yes, or passively saying yes, also doesn't negate the fact that there are many days when you just want to run away. <laughs> that is like, true. I, I can't. And so when you have those moments, I think it brings up a lot of regret and shame because you said yes. Right. And you're not the one that's sick, but it's hard for caregivers to prioritize their own feelings and their own emotions and their own needs because somewhere along the line, without being directly said, we've all been given this idea that society thinks that, A, we should be doing what we're doing right now, no matter how difficult it may be. We should have always decided we were going to be the caregiver. Why would we think there'd be any other option for us? And also, just deal with it. Right. Yeah. Like, as if it's that easy, you know, like with my husband, I loved how much um, attention he got, how much people really, really wanted to know if he was going to be OK, um, who regularly check up on him. And, and, you know, a decade later, who are always checking their um, the, the updates that I put out about him. But there is always a part of me that just thinks, you know what, this is really messed up because from the very start, I was told by everybody that knows me that they at least were educated and informed enough to know that having cancer was dangerous, but not educated and informed or caring enough to realize that it affects the whole family and that mm -hmm. the person caregiving for that person who is sick is the one that's shouldering most of the weight of everything that's happening. And so, you know, so you go as a caregiver that, you know, if that's the, your existence, if that's your reality, if you find out that your mom has to move in with you, or you have to decide if, if going to a facility is the right idea, you know, you know, having someone in your house that has dementia or Alzheimer's, that is, is full time. Even yep. if you have people coming in, it is your life. It is all consuming. And so that, that is you selflessly giving yourself to being a caregiver. And I just, it, it really frustrates me to see caregivers feel like they don't deserve something. They don't deserve happiness you can have both. Your life can feel really crappy because you're watching your parent deteriorate in front of your eyes and you can enjoy life at the same time because it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge. Yes. And it has to be an active choice for you to make. Um, and it has a lot to do with mindset, but I think it's difficult because no one's telling us your, your job is so extremely important that we all want to support you being able to care for yourself. Like we don't have the societal support, you know, when you have a child, oftentimes people will come and help and care for you and help you care for the child, because they know that a woman is extremely integral and important to the, the beginning of life, right? Social value is placed on becoming a mother. Social value is placed on people who have, you know, the oncologist and the neurologist that help us with the people that we care for. They have a high social value. And so when any of these people say, I need to take a break, 
I'm not working a whole month because I'm going to go on vacation. I, my husband had an oncologist. They would take off a whole entire month in the summer just because they needed a break. And so, and that was okay. Everyone was like, oh, okay. So they're a high paid doctor. They can, they deserve because they do so much. Well, they can afford it. (laughs) Right. But we all do so much. And us just stepping away to go get a coffee with a friend sometimes feels like too much that we're going to be judged and we don't deserve to do it because we don't understand how important what we do is. And it's because society is not helping us get there. None of our friends and family, you know, show pride in us being a caregiver, right? <laughs> That's true. No, a lot of times they're they're an impediment. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about, you know, the celebration of new life, whether you birth a child, adopt a child, or however it comes into your life. Mm-hmm. You know, we have baby showers. And I have joked, not necessarily actually meaning it to be a joke, <laughs> but we need like caregiver showers, like you know, yes. you've moved into an advanced stage of Alzheimer's or dementia. And now you need, you know, these, you know, like they make yes. those diaper cakes for babies. Can we please make a diaper cake for right. mom? <laughs> yes. You know, because it's, you know, you don't want to have to go through fighting with your mom about, you know, you're having these incontinence issues. Da, 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 da. Fortunately, mm-hmm. I had learned, thank you to my daughter, who was just <laughs> stubborn, did not want to do the potty training thing. She like drive through the night for months, months and months, but just <laughs> refused to give up the diapers. And, you know, I, I talked to one mom who'd had twins. And then I finally talked to another working mom, another self-employed public facing. She owned a deli, was down the, down the um, block from our, our photography studio. And she's like, yeah, my son was kind of the same way. I just took him home and threw out all the diapers and just gave him underwear and told him not to pee in them. And I'm like, okay. So that's mm-hmm. exactly what I did with my daughter. I took the advice from the one mom is, you know, get the lacy, yeah. nylony ones that are just going <laughs> to stick. Sorry if you guys are listening to this while you're eating. <laughs> and just tell her we're done with diapers. And she's like, I want my diaper. I'm like, nope, we're done with that. And yeah. it's pe- pretty much when my mom started having urinary incontinence, I just basically took out all of her underwear. And which, of course, was kind of a hide and seek hunt thing for me. <laughs> and just put in all of the adult, you know, um, incontinence briefs mm-hmm. and never, ever had an issue. Never. Mm-hmm. I, the care staff never commented about an issue. She never gave me an issue. It was just, it was just like, bada bing, we've moved into yeah. this new stage. <laughs> and I don't know, it's been a little while since I've had baby diapers, <laughs> but, you know, that stuff's not cheap. No. And, you know, and then at some point, it, you have to move into the ones with the tabs on the sides if they're yeah. bed bound and oh yeah, yeah. It's just like, you know, but you need grab bars and you need all mm-hmm. of the same kind of end of life adaptive stuff that you do when they're babies. Like you got to baby proof your house. Now you sort of have to, you know, old lady proof your house, which yeah. sounds terrible. And I don't think, you know, well, I think we, as a society, we embrace you know, youthfulness, being fit and beautiful and all these, you know, things that most of us don't like at some point, we're not going to be young and fit and beautiful. That's just life. You know, like my paternal grandmother lived to 103. So (laughs) I'm, I am very solidly middle aged because I am 55 that, you know, well, okay, that makes me 110, but it's possible. Yeah. You know, so, but it's like, I'm going to spend more years young or old than I did young, which is fine. Yeah. I'm totally fine with that. But <laughs> we have to normalize aging, which is coming. I think, you know, one thing we could thank the baby boomers for is they're all aging. <laughs> <laughs> they're older than us. So we get, get to follow in their footsteps on that one. And we need to normalize that, you know, disease happens and it's, and it's imperative that we support each other. Like, yeah. Your friends and neighbors and family need to support you guys, just like our friends and family and neighbors needed to support, you know, my dad while he was taking care of my mom and and while I was taking care of her. Yes, she was in a care home, but that just means you're the captain of the care team. Exactly. <laughs> it does not mean yeah. you get to just wash your hands and say, OK, I don't have to worry about any of this <laughs> stuff because, you know, you there's I mean, I guess you could, but, you know, most people have bigger hearts than that, thankfully. And 
Yeah. You know, but you were saying, you know, like the doctors step away for a month because they just need, especially a an oncologist, almost said urologist, that's the wrong one, <laughs> an oncologist, because, you know, they're not dealing with, you know, a lot of happy stuff. So that, right. you know, they need that mental break just like you do. But, you know, if you took a month off people, you know, you're totally right. People would be like, oh, I yeah. can't believe she's taking time off. Yeah, what if? Like if you said I need, I, you know, things with my mom have been a lot. I just need to go away for a long weekend. Let's say, you know, how difficult is that for a lot of people to do just because they can't find someone to help them to come care for the person for those few days. And also the fear of just the judgment of someone saying, why, why are you, le you can't, that's not, you're supposed to stay like, that's your job. What if they need you? Know? you? Right. And so it's, there's so much just pressure to not need anything as a caregiver when in all actuality, if you think about it, the em emphasis should be put on a caregiver having the support to care for themselves, because if that person is caring for a loved one, short or long-term, it doesn't matter. Um, it is in everyone's best interest for that caregiver to be well, to be emotionally well, to be physically well, um, because the happier, the more able that person, that caregiver is to do what everyone wants them to do and what they want to do as well. Um, the happier that person is, the happier everybody else is. I mean, how many times have we done something for the person that we care for? I mean, I have stomped up the stairs with a glass of water <laughs> because I was tired because it was right after a surgery and I just wanted a break and a nap and I didn't want to go get water. And I did out of compulsion and I stomped up the stairs and found myself doing it and stopped at the top of the stairs. And I'm like, okay, I need a break. Like I really need to sleep. Let's see what he needs all together so that I can just have a few hours. And when I, so if I would have just come in and said, here's your freaking water, like yeah. irritated and annoyed, you know, on the other end of that is a person who just had surgery, who has their own issues that they're dealing with, their own insecurities. And then the person that is has stepped in to be the full time caregiver is is showing signs of cracking under the pressure of caregiving. You know, that doesn't help a person heal. That doesn't ha help a person, you know, have a happy moment when you're, you know, just like angrily handing a glass of water, <laughs> chucking and a I, water bottle at their hand. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's an important part to remember the happier you are, the more you're able to care for yourself as a caregiver, as a person, um, the better caregiver you will be. And so in, in the end, the person that you care for actually is benefiting from you caring for yourself because let's face it, you know, there's a lot of stress related diseases that are, are very prevalent with people who are caregivers. And if you continue to go down a path where in, in the future, you'll need someone to care for you, then how does that all work out? Like who's, who's the next caregiver of the family? And I got to line them up. It's not cool. Do you have, because the Alzheimer's Association puts out a statistic that says there's like over 16 million family caregivers. And in 2022, they estimate, because obviously 2022 is not over yet, that we will provide over 300, I think it's $326 billion of unpaid care. Yeah. So I cannot do that kind of math in my head. So <laughs> maybe somebody get a calculator. Neither can I. That's why I do a podcast. <laughs> yeah, for real. It's like, I'm a creative, I'm an entrepreneur, but- there's no, I, I, I should, do, I'm going to use the calculator on my computer. And I think everybody uses that AARP um, report as like a blanket, um, you know, fact finding and number um, source for caregivers, because I don't know, I, I don't, I've never seen numbers divided by specifics, right? Well, I was wondering if they had, if there was a number like, and I can't do the math because I can't read the calculator this far away from the monitor. Um, plus, I'm not sure that my 
little cheapy calculator on the on the Mac will go up. To the, <laughs> there's too many zeros involved in that. <laughs> we'll have to figure it out and put it in the show notes. Then. Definitely, but it's like, you know, there's a value in what we're doing, and we need to understand that, and we need to help educate people, especially the medical profession. In my humble opinion, but most of my listeners know that. I have kind of a beef with them most of the time Yeah, is, you know, so if whatever 16, whatever million divided or 326 billion divided by 16 million thing, that it's just hard to say. <laughs> like, so what is my, you know, and I guess I'm not factored into the family caregiver anymore because my mom's gone, but what is my contribution to that billion dollars, you know, two three 326 right. billion dollars of care and, I think that's what people need to understand is it's like we are providing a whole lot of free services and Mm -hmm. we get very little to no training. Like you probably got more post-operative care training than, oh no, oh Lord, that makes makes me even more angry at the medical profession. There, we have had a lot of um, experiences with drains. And if you haven't had to experience drains, you're welcome. <laughs> um, they, they are not fun. Um, and for someone who, like me, I, I'm not squeamish with blood, but I don't like seeing flesh. Like I don't like seeing past the skin level. And when you have drains, you do. And so, you know, I've stripped drains. I've had to help with open wounds and without, with just being handed a pack of gauze, right? Oh, Lord. Keep it clean. And so, you know, there was one of the first um, drain holes after they pulled it out. Um, and the next day I was like, I, I can't do this. Like, I can't, I am not a nurse. Like I have an episode literally labeled, I am not a nurse because I could not handle flesh, like a hole in a person's body and me responsible for it. And I was angry because I was not prepared to take care of that. And yeah, we figured it out. And, you know, it helps that my husband was a medic in the army. And so he, you know, he had like a a good head on his shoulders when he wasn't, you know, I mean, he was getting over a major surgery. (laughs) And so, um, you know, that just angered me because we're, I don't understand how people assume that we know how to do these things. Um, or, you know, how to, how to change a person's clothing. If you're first becoming a caregiver of someone who is bed bound, right? Like there are so many classes, like I really and truly Every hospital system should have a caregiver um, department where they give classes on how to do these things. I know they exist, but they're, they exist privately, right? There's mm-hmm. other organizations and companies that have them, but they should, you should have a team, even if it, if it's something that they don't feel is a big deal, or you've been caring for your parent for years now and, and their Alzheimer's is, is just right with quote yeah. progressing. Um, there's still things as things progress, there are still changes that we are never prepared for. And they know that they, that it will happen, right? Like if that's their specialty, they know how things progress. And so they should have some way to communicate with us about what we will start to see, how to be prepared for it and how to learn these skills that we clearly need to learn how to do. And I just don't understand why that's not a, a priority. Because they don't see the value in training somebody. They're not, one, the system doesn't pay them for that stuff. There's problem one. But they don't see how training you to deal with drains, et cetera, or, mm-hmm. you know, somebody who's bedbound from Alzheimer's, how to keep them clean so that they don't develop UTIs, which is right. a serious problem with the older adults. But if you're bed bound, it's like even worse than, you know, somebody with Alzheimer's. Like my mom wasn't a water drinker and getting her to drink water was like, you know, it was like trying to get my dog to drink water. It's like he either yeah. did it or he doesn't, you know, it's just, it wasn't something like let's like force feed her with it. And, you yeah. know, she didn't see the need. She didn't understand the, what the pro why, why, you know, so it's just like, <laughs> it's just like one of those, moments when you wanted to run screaming into the street. What they don't understand is 
if you don't teach people these things that you need to know and you don't have some way of them coming back and saying, okay, you showed me how to do these drain things or, you know, this open mm -hmm. wound on my husband's foot thing. Um, mm -hmm. Am I doing this right? Because I'm a little concerned. You keep them out of the hospitals and the doctor's offices. Exactly. And, you know, especially for somebody with Alzheimer's, they can't cure them, you right. know. So one of the things that I'm kind of starting to advocate for, and right now it's like, <laughs> I hope I'm not a lone wolf. I'm just going to keep talking about it. <laughs> so maybe other people should, you know, join me in this, in this opinion, <laughs> but I feel, and I'm going to ask you, are you guys on palliative care? No. Okay. You should be. Are you familiar with palliative care? I I'm not sure that I am the way that okay. I should. <laughs> okay. Palliative <laughs> care basically is it's, it's like hospice, but you don't have to stop, uh, life-saving medic, you know, treatments, medications, mm -hmm. surgeries, whatever which mm -hmm. obviously would apply to your husband for, you know, like, you know, but it's there to like support the caregiver, support the patient. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a whole life team effort. And I think when somebody is diagnosed with any form of, you know, dementia causing illness, mm -hmm. that instead of here's a pamphlet for the Alzheimer's association, good luck. Right. I'll see you again in six months, which sometimes is more than some people get. Yeah, they should be immediately said you need we're, we're going to get you signed up for palliative care. It is not free through Medicare like hospice. Mm -hmm. But when I looked into it, it was about two hundred fifty to three hundred dollars. Now it's been two or three years. So don't <laughs> quote me on. I know there's inflation and all that stuff. Life keeps moving along. Um, <laughs> but when you think of like when my dad was on hospice, we had to have 24 seven caregivers because his memory went into the sewer mm -hmm. and my mom's memory was already there. So I like literally overnight went, went from at least one parent who was rational and logical and could think to two parents with essentially no brains. And we had to have 24 seven caregivers. This was at the beginning of 2017 was over $700 a day. Wow. So we're talking about $35,000 a month. So if yeah. you got to pay a thousand dollars for palliative care, and I'm pretty sure it's not that high, it's mm -hmm. well worth that when in-home caregivers, which are very difficult to get, um, and don't necessarily come with enough training to assist, you know, they might be better trained to assist you guys than somebody yeah. with Alzheimer's, especially advanced Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. I know caregivers that do get assistance from, um, paid care help. And mm -hmm. sometimes they got to train them like, oh, let me show you how to change this brief on my mom. Like, hello, you're supposed to be a nurse. Like, why am I teaching you this? I'm the, I'm the millennial caregiver that had to learn this from YouTube or however they learned it. I don't know how they learned it. Trial and error, probably. But the palliative care is there to support everybody. And so you mm -hmm. need to check into it for you guys. <laughs> but I really honestly think that anybody diagnosed with some form of dementia they just mm -hmm. need to automatically be enrolled. Like, okay, we can't cure you. We can't, we can't prevent from happening what's going to happen other than right. euthanasia, which is not legal. Mm -hmm. um, question, you know, like super slippery slope with humans. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you're going to need help. And these people are going to help, like, get you started. Yeah. Because just to send somebody home with a pat on the back and a pamphlet is just, like, insulting. <laughs> now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. 
I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Right. And then, so if, if, if now we've, we've agreed that we don't really get support from doctors and we don't get a lot of societal support, then, um, then most caregivers are like, so I'm just doomed to hate my life. Like there's, how could I take care of myself? Um, if no one is giving me the time to even figure out what it is that I need to do. And, you know, if, people that have asked me, well, then what do I do? Like my, my friends and families don't get it. No one understands me. You know, the doctors don't seem to think that I'm of any importance, (laughs) you know, is is there any hope? And the answer is yes, but you have to want it. Like you can't wait for someone to make time for you anymore. Like you can't wait for someone to do anything other than, oh, hey, I saw a thing about caregivers and you should meditate because if you're not a meditator, that doesn't mean crap to you, right? No, it's a skill you have to learn and you don't have time to learn that skill right now. You know, nobody has time to try to figure out how to care for themselves. And it is the most important thing you can do for yourself. And it can't be a passive endeavor. You have to really care enough about the person that you care for to actually want to think about the possibility of learning how to care for yourself. And once you get to that point where you're like, yeah, I have, I can't continue like this. Then you, you get um, stuck on that next roadblock where it's like, well, what do I do? And there's, there's not a lot. There's, there's tons of lists. I've been given so many lists of, I should journal, I should do yoga, I should meditate. Yeah. I know all those things. Right. But I know those things because I'm, I'm certified and trained in doing those things. So, you know, I think when, when I, when someone tells me, yeah, I got another list or the doctor told me that I should enjoy life and meditate (laughs) and it infuriates me because everyone's telling us what we should do. And nobody's helping us figure out how to do it. And caregivers don't have the energy or the time to figure out how, like how to meditate. Like I meditate. It's not, it's not easy. And there's so many different, like meditate how there's so many different ways to meditate. And so I, I just, you know, when caregivers try to care for themselves and it falls apart because they're trying to do something off a list And then they assume this isn't, I I guess I'm, there's something wrong with me because I can't do this. It's, it's not you. There is nothing wrong with you. If you can't make caring for yourself work, it's because nobody has cared enough to just grab you by the hand and say, we're going to figure out what care means for you. You know, maybe you were in the military when you were living your other life, right? Maybe going to a firing range is self-care, right? Not meditation. (laughs) It's not meditation. It's not journaling. Or maybe you were a person who did sports um, when you were younger, high school, college, right? Um, Maybe you need to do something that's movement-based, but that's not going to be on the list. Trying to train for something or just get out and run or ride a bike. Like if you don't already have that in your life, when you become a caregiver, it's really hard to bring it in because changing your habits are difficult. It's just, as a human being, it's difficult. Yeah, it takes work. Yeah. It's it's like a consistent, like I'm going to, you know, continue going to the gym when we were working to put my dad on hospice, the hospice mm -hmm. gal called me. When I had, I had just gotten to the gym, I think I used the ladies room and I was about to, you know, go into the class and they needed my attention. And I said, well, I just got to the gym, um, but blah, blah, blah. And I said, I, I guess I could go home and shower and, and meet you 20 miles from my home. And she goes, no, 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 it's fine. We'll find a different time later this afternoon. You, you just stay at the gym. And I was like, wow, this is impressive. I was yeah. like super thrilled with that. But that was already a routine. If I... and. Breaking that routine, I was like, I wasn't really happy about 
even yeah. offering to say, well, I guess I could leave. I'm right. already here, but I guess I could leave, you know. And it was yeah. because it was like kind of a one off. I knew that wasn't going to keep happening, mm-hmm. but I was really impressed that she she allowed me to to continue with what was necessary for me. But yeah, if you're not if you're not into daily workouts or walking the dogs or whatever, it's mm-hmm. you know, it takes consistent effort, you know, especially sometimes you just you know, there's just days where like I just don't feel like doing Peloton today. <laughs> and you're like, but I'm not gonna feel better if I don't. So like let me just put on my workout clothes. That's yeah. how I got into because I was not um a workout person. I'm very happy reading books for hours on end. And now I have a watch that basically says, get up, you lazy bum. <laughs> it's time to move you something. Know. For some and, characters, just mm-hmm. simply reading a book for five minutes from doing nothing for yourself to reading a book for five minutes is care because that might be extremely difficult for that person to do. And so because it's not just reading a book for five minutes, it's setting boundaries it's making yourself a priority, right? Mm-hmm. If you don't say in the morning, today I'm going to try something for myself. I'm going to pick up a book or I'm going to look at something online and it's that is not a video or social media. And I sit down, I'm going to read it for five minutes and I'm going to do it at this time of the day. And I'm going to do everything that I can to hold on to those five minutes, that's you creating a container for your own self-care, that's you creating boundaries, that's you prioritizing yourself. Just doing those things, going through that thought process to try to get you to just five minutes of reading a book because you've done absolutely nothing for yourself, just thinking it through, maybe getting to it maybe not reading a whole five minutes because your attention span is just like totally (laughs) crapped out because of everything that we do. Right. But the fact that you actually made yourself and your care in in, an important thing for that day, that is an accomplishment because every day that you try to do that, it'll continue to get a little bit easier. You'll start to be able to grab onto that time a little bit more, and then you'll be able to add on, oh, well, five minutes of reading felt really good today. I actually did it. I'm going to keep doing that. Maybe I'm going to add in just sitting down quietly outside with a cup of coffee in the morning, you know, because I think that sometimes self-care feels like it has to be this huge thing, like massages and yoga classes. I teach yoga. I get it, right? It feels good if it's for you, Mm -hmm. but it does take a lot of time out of your day. If you don't have that time, if all you have is a couple of minutes, there are things that you can do to make yourself feel better. And the important part of that is that as soon as you come to a place where you can release and relax, and you can just breathe, your nervous system starts to shift. Mm-hmm. It is not in that fight or flight. You, you're you not engaged in trying to handle an emergency or something stressful. And the more you can do that, the more you can just take these little tiny moments in your day to release stress, it shifts your stress response into something passive that is beneficial for your body and your, and your, and your system. And so the more you can find times to do that, A, is going to feel good. And B, is going to actually be something that is good for your health that will start to offset all the stress that you live with. So knowing that it doesn't now, of course, going for long bike rides, going for long walks, taking, you know, really nice long yoga classes or massages. Those are all self-care. Actually, anything that makes you just say, you know, and breathe and just like feel good about what you just did for yourself. Those are that self-care. And so don't feel like it has to cost anything. It doesn't have to be complicated. But the important thing is that you can't go from a list that someone gave you. You have to really, really think of what do I enjoy doing? And if it's been a long time since you've done something that you've enjoyed, go back as far as you can until you find that thing. It might be when you're in high school or when you're in <laughs> elementary school. Maybe you liked coloring. All right, so buy a coloring book and some crayons. You see how coloring became socially acceptable, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, things can change, but the thing is we have to talk more about the things that we do. Like we have to be more open at being vulnerable and saying, hey, I need this help, right? 
or this is how my life sucks as a caregiver. Everyone should know because then the more we talk about it, then the less people can say, oh, I didn't know it was that hard. Oh, well, it's true. You know, so I think we keep a lot to ourselves. Um, and, and you and I put ourselves in these positions where then we're trying to talk about the, the realness of it all, which puts us in a place where, you know, we're, we're becoming vulnerable because we're opening ourselves up. Right. And, and we're doing it in an effort to help other people. But if, if you can tell like your mom, your dad, your friend, your husband, your spouse, you know, Hey, this is how, this is my experience as a caregiver. Just like sometimes if you let the words out, if all of those thoughts just get released, they feel so, so less big than they usually are in your head. And I think we just need to share more and we're we're all trying to be perfect and that's impossible. (laughs) Yeah. We're all human. So perfection is not happening. I know a caregiver that basically gets her nails done regularly and goes on regular like 48 hour self-care like she calls them overnights and that's not easy and um and there was one where she went away where something happened well her mom got very unstable on her feet basically her brain was forgetting to tell was forgetting to communicate with her body on how to walk her mom can physically do it but the communication on how to do it has gone away because of the the alzheimer's and the mom the caregiver basically she there was she didn't think fast enough to like as mom started slipping to the floor to pivot mom to the chair so mom ended up on the floor the caregiver kind of felt injured and um this was a paid caregiver just And she really freaked out and she called the gal and said, you know, I can't do this. I'm leaving. And the caregiver had to end their trip and they were not happy for a long time with this other gal who had Mm -hmm. been a very good um, help for up until that point. But it, it, you know, the transition from where mom was two months ago to that day was so big that it just was overwhelming, which is one of the reasons I tell people like you got to have people in your life all the time because if you try to bring somebody in when it's really really hard mm-hmm. it's just really really hard for everybody yeah. um but i have i facilitate a support group and i have a really awesome story that i i feel like i can share so a particular caregiver i was reminding them that you have to keep your needs in focus your needs matter it may be you you know you may not be able to go for long bike rides but maybe you could take a spin around the block exactly. you know your needs matter yes they may have to the the focus of them may have to shift how you get them done may have to shift but don't mm-hmm. just abandon them don't just put them on the shelf and say i'm going to get back to that you know you've been on this journey with your husband for 10 years my mm-hmm. mom had alzheimer's for 20 years you know my dad passed away when i was 50 And it was very possible that my mom could have lived into her 80s, which would have meant I was in my, you know, late 60s -hmm. when my mom passed. I'm like, I'm not going to give up the next 15 years of my life because Lord only knows what I'll be at at 65 or something. Like, I might, you never, there's no guarantee I'll be fine and as normal as I ever will be. (laughs) And so this particular person decided they needed a chef. And I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. You know, hey, there's the, you know, the chef might have helped my husband and I in the last, you know, when he was dealing with his foot. Is during the pandemic he took over cook, doing all the cooking, and he hasn't really relinquished giving back most of it to me, which is kind of annoying because then he complains that I don't make the I don't make dinner and ugh, just the whole thing. So, in searching for someone to come in and do cooking or however, providing meals to this particular um, household was supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. a spot came open in an assisted living community very close to their home and this caregiver said well this is a sign moved them into the assisted living community (laughs) is beyond elated it's like i'm on a cruise i can't believe i didn't do this i mean like zero negative anything and i'm like i just said to focus on your needs not move you guys into a assisted that's a big jump but yeah. it's like, you know, when you fo- like 
She found the solution to her problem. She is so much happier. The person that needed the care is so much happier. There's more engagement. It's different. There's activities. There's like, <sighs> she's like, I can't believe we didn't do this. Oh, I was trying to keep it neutral. Sorry. But okay. it's like, I, I share this story because, you know, a lot of times, especially someone, you know, caring for a parent with Alzheimer's, we promise them, oh, I'll never put you in a home. And, yeah. you know, you have zero clue. You have zero clue if you even are going to be able to manage that. Like I said, yeah. my husband's a foot taller, 100 pounds more than me. Like, how am I going to manage if he needed physical help with right. toileting and showering? I'm like, he wouldn't even let me help him with a stupid foot. So <laughs> like, you can only imagine what a problem it would be. I mean, my yeah. mom was a challenge. And my mom and I are like the same height. And she weighed less than me. So... Mm -hmm. I had a serious physical advantage over her and she was still a pain in the butt. Yeah. You know, just so you've got to focus on your own needs and your own dreams. But, you know, like if you want to finish your degree, great. You might have to do it one freaking course at a time and it might right. take 10 years, but it's right. not going to happen if you wait 10 years and hope the person is better or right. gone, depending like better in your case, gone in mine. Because uh -huh. we have no clue and we don't know where we'll be. So that's, and the other thing that I always suggest to people, I, I post this kind of stuff on my social media platforms a lot, is, you know, like, it's really hard to get out of the house. Uh -huh. But we're making that a big deal. You know what? Well, it's supposed to be like 110 this weekend, so maybe not eat yeah. outside. But it's like, if you always eat in the kitchen, eat in the formal dining room. Use mm -hmm. the fancy plates. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to go out, go sit in the backyard. Have yep. a picnic in the grass in the backyard. It might be a little extra work. Getting my mom in and out of the house and up and down on the grass would have been a lot. But, you know, yeah. okay, so probably put her in a, in a you know, folding chair, whatever. Those chairs yeah. that we take to the park. <laughs> it's been a little while since I've done that, apparently. <laughs> it's like, we have to take a step back and say, I need x like i need i need to see something other than these walls great yeah. that doesn't mean you got to go away for 48 hours that just means go no. outside walk right. the dog ask the neighbor can you come sit with my mom while i walk the dog they'd be like yeah. oh sure or yeah. invite the neighbors over to have lunch in the backyard have them bring dessert or whatever it's yeah. there's a lot of ways to change your surroundings without it being yet another giant chore that you just have to do because <laughs> nobody right. wants more work. That's right. <laughs> do you have any suggestions on how people should focus on them in the, you know, like you gave the five minutes of reading. That's an excellent, you know, you managed mm -hmm. five minutes today. Let me throw yeah. out for those people who are following me on Instagram. If you have not seen the group of caregivers that have quote dance parties it was Friday morning and Friday evening, and I think they have now added a Wednesday. They mm -hmm. literally get on a Zoom call and dance like goofy fools. That's and one awesome. of these days I'm going to do it, but they're like Midwest yeah. and East Coast and yeah. like the Friday morning dance parties at 7 a.m. So I'd have to like <laughs> jump out of bed and throw on something that, you know, <laughs> so I, I'm not going to dance in my, my night clothes because that would right. just be Zoom would crash forever if I did that. <laughs> but it's like. They, they get sweaty, they move, they're mm -hmm. laughing. You know, sometimes their loved ones join them and mm -hmm. it's like 10 minutes. Yeah. And the, and the, the group is growing and it's just like, and they, you know, sometimes people prop up their phones and they like dance in the backyard. And sometimes there's a group of them in the living room. You know, one, mm -hmm. like a, they post the, like the little zoom screenshot so you can kind of see what everybody's doing. That's an option. You know, there's lots yeah. of options once we, we just kind of have to. Yes. You have to focus on what you need and find a way to make it happen in these trying circumstances. So do you have suggestions so for how people should also try that that I haven't mentioned? You know, I think the important part is to be open for it not to work. Right. Because that's sometimes a good point. We try to do something. And so we put in all of this time and trouble trying to schedule it and figure it out. And then it just flops. Be, be okay with that. Because if you're too hung up on the perfection of it all and how this is might be like, what will save you? It's it. That's not it. The important part is that you're trying to do something for yourself and you've actually 
made it a priority to, to think it through. But, you know, you have to pick what works best for you. If you like to move, then move, like moving, walking. If you like to walk, but you don't feel like you can leave the house for that long time, just go to the end of the sidewalk, go to the end of the driveway, just stick your head out a window. Like if you're in an <laughs> apartment and you can't get down there, you know, um, journal, like writing out or talking out what you're thinking and feeling helps you process the things that you're going through, you know, a lot of times, if that's your thing, that will really work. You know, meditation is awesome. Um, you can do simple breathing meditations. Um, there's a lot out there that you can follow. Sometimes it's just laying on the floor and listening to music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll lay in the middle of a hallway. Like I'll lay down in a place that is not usually a place to lay down in. And and so just get yourself out, like you said, of those four walls that you're always surrounded with. Give yourself something different to look at. Find a reason to laugh. Let the crying commence so that it doesn't just keep staying buried down deep inside your body. And just, you know, be okay with just being you and having yeah. fun doing it. We're all neat people. We need to understand yeah. that. So I have another suggestion. This is for dog owners because you said, you know, if you can't get out, you know, go to the end of the driveway. Well, I have a really long driveway, so that's kind of <laughs> beneficial. Um, there's some times while I'm waiting for the toaster to pop up or the microwave to do its thing. Mm -hmm. um, I just run a circle around the house and let the dogs chase me. And trust me, that gets my heart rate going real fast. <laughs> the dogs always win that race. And, you know, it makes them happy. It makes, you know, it's like, it's just silly and you laugh and I can just picture yeah. like if my mom was sitting on the couch, she'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> What's going on? Why? And then she'd probably laugh. So, you know, I never, I was always, my mom thought I was her best friend. So there was always a little bit of this formality and yeah. I regret that I did not ever learn how to get around that. I was totally fine with being the best friend. So, but you know, there's like a lot of things where, you know, it's like there was not a lot of hugging or hand holding or I love yous or any of that stuff that would be nice now that, you know, those memories yeah. could have been nice now that she's gone, but <laughs> I, I have to focus on, I did all I could to provide her with the best quality of life and the most joy and, mm -hmm. and just say, you know what? I did the best I could. Nobody freaking told me how to do this. I had to figure yeah. it out. I had to start a flipping podcast to talk to people to figure <laughs> out. How to, so there's a whole thing. You know, that yeah. that's not necessarily it's it ended up being my self care, but I don't recommend it for everybody. Yeah. It's a lot of work. But this, you know, it's just you gotta figure out what you need and how, you know, mm -hmm. like I feel like screaming. I'm gonna run around the house like a crazy yes. person for yes. three seconds or you know, forty five seconds because <laughs> any more than that and I'm gonna die of <laughs> die of heart failure. <laughs> and if you got dogs and they chase you, great, just don't let them trip you. Um yeah. you know, getting out Getting out in the sunlight, um, you know, getting some vitamin D is extremely important to brain health and our mental health. Yes. Uh, my daughter started hiking and she's just shocked at how nature and vitamin D are hugely important for feeling better. Yes. What's some of the other stuff. Oh, and I just read recently about being on the water. So we live across the street from a lake. Hence the paddle okay. boarding with the doggies that caused yeah. my shoulder to, to throw up a, a, my shoulders on strike right now. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, there's a big part of me that just like wants to like get the paddle board, get on it and just like float in the lake. As long as I don't okay. get in the boat lane, you know, that, that might be a problem. <laughs> but it's just like, just being on the water is so peaceful and quiet. And, yeah. you know, if you don't worry about falling in, uh, the lake is not very deep, so it's pretty warm. You know, it's yeah. just, it's amazing. Like I've never really been a lake water person, um, mm -hmm. but it's amazing. So that, you know, okay, if you're not blessed with living across the street from a lake or you don't have a pool in your backyard, you know, maybe get a baby pool and, you know, mm -hmm. fill that up and splash around in that, you know, yeah. your loved one will love, you know, this is, I don't know how it works with somebody with cancer. I don't know if they've got, you know, like when you're talking about drains and surgeries and stuff, it is yeah. not something that my type of caregiver has to worry about most of the time. So that you know, <laughs> yeah. we just have to worry about the fact that you know you can't leave them alone because you cannot understand what 
you know, like where their brain might go because yeah. they're not necessarily in today. They might be in a whole different decade and it's really hard to tell. Yeah. But, you know, just sometimes just being silly and having fun, just it makes them silly and have fun. And Definitely. We need more fun in life. <laughs> we do. <laughs> well, this has been great. So tell everybody where they can find you and I will make sure all of it is linked in the show notes. And then I'm yes. going to do that math with the how much Alzheimer's <laughs> caregivers are give, donating to the community. <laughs> yes, I can be found at loveyourcaregivinglife.com. All the podcast episodes, all of the other supportive stuff that I have, PDFs. And I have a digital magazine for caregivers that also is accessible there. It's called Caregiving Confessions um, because we do need to have more fun. So I created something that I always wanted. Um, so yeah, loveyourcaregivinglife.com. And from there, you can find me everywhere else. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate this. I think this could have been like a multi-hour episode, oh, yeah. but we well, know that. Back. <laughs> yes, it's true. And we know that our audiences do not have the time to listen to a Joe Rogan length podcast. Plus right. it's time for lunch. So <laughs> <All> <laughs> and, <right. laughs> and other things. So I appreciate that you uh, came on today and discussed this. It's actually kind of interesting to talk to a non-dementia type caregiver. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I'm sure there's a lot that the different types of caregivers can learn from each other. So that's something to consider for the future. Yeah. And yeah. I wish you guys well, and please check into palliative care because yes. you need it. And so does he. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Thank you so much for having me on here. <laughs> you're welcome. Thanks so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.